Some say history is a river that flows endlessly. I say that history is a series of stories written by each person's experiences. Welcome to Stories, a history of Appalachia, one story at a time. Hello, podcast listeners, and welcome to Stories, a history of Appalachia. I'm Steve Gilley, along with Rod Mullins, and today we're going to tell you the story of the Great Moonshine Conspiracy Trial of 1935. I'll tell you, Steve, when you hear the word moonshine, it just conjures up all sorts of stories about Mm -hmm. the radical way things were back in the United States during Prohibition. It was just unreal back in those times when people were looking to make a buck and make it quick. And we're going to go to the very heart of moonshine manufacturing during the Depression. Now, during that time, times were tough. Money was hard to come by. And many folks from Appalachia went back to that time-honored tradition of making moonshine in order to earn cash and keep themselves afloat. But no place in the area did that quite like Franklin County, Virginia, known as the moonshine capital of the world. If you've never been to Franklin County, Virginia, let me just tell you, it's south of Roanoke with its county seat being Rocky Mount. And I have to tell you, too, Steve, there's a little locale in between there that's also known for being a speed trap as well, Boone's Mill. But another story at another time. Franklin County moonshiners turned the craft of liquor making into a very large and profitable industry. In fact, it's been estimated that the tax revenue from the manufacture of moonshine in the county from 1930 through 1935 would have easily been $5,500,000 or just over in today's monetary terms, $95 million, Steve. Wow. Well, you know, there were nightly bootlegger caravans rolling down the uh, curvy mountain roads every night, heading north, mainly to Chicago, it's said, into the hands of waiting mobsters. According to a federal commission, which was set up to study enforcement of prohibition, in one county, Franklin, it's claimed that 90 people out of 100 are making or have some connection with illicit liquor. This was a busy place, Rod. I don't like that word illicit either, Steve. Uh, No, I figured you wouldn't. But we'll just say (laughs) untaxed liquor. How about that? (laughs) Untaxed. Well, I guess in Prohibition, though, it would have been illicit. I guess it would have been. Yeah, because it was. That's just a wrong name. Liquor's liquor. That's right. Uh, Anyway, according to federal officials, the uh, county had even been divided into districts overseen by deputy sheriffs who were paid to protect the moonshiners from the feds. These officials overseeing the operations were charging large protection fees in exchange for looking the other way. So, surprise, surprise, we have corruption in Appalachia. Who would have thought of such a thing? (laughs) Well, and and not being connected to the coal industry. You know, I mean, hey, it's not pork rinds, but still, it's, it's, (laughs) it's corruption. But anyway, what got the Fed's attention out of this, it appears, was the amount of sugar coming into the county. Who'd have thunk it? Well, train loads of sugar, corn, and even malt were coming into the county on a regular basis. Now, apparently, there was enough sugar, for example, to get this, Steve, to supply New York City food needs for a year coming into the small county and going into the production of whiskey. Oh, my goodness. Well, the uh, conspiracy unraveled thanks to the efforts of federal agent and former World War I spy, Colonel Thomas Bailey. Sounds like an interesting fellow. Bailey was sent in as an undercover agent for the federal government in an effort to find out just exactly what was going on and to help break it up. So starting in 1934, Bailey went to the still operators posing as a small-time moonshine buyer it seems like that's how they got Popcorn Sutton, if I remember. I believe they did. Uh, anyway, as he got to know the sellers and to get more information about who had what for sale, he discovered just how large this operation was. Now, Bailey had uncovered a complex system driven by bribery and extortion. Still, operators would pay local sheriffs for protection from federal law enforcement. Bailey was directed to protect rather than arrest the small distillers in exchange for information that could be used to arrest the uh, ringleaders of the entire operation, which I think was a very smart move, Rod. I think so, too. And, I mean, Steve, this is almost like the feds had technically got into the business 
with the small distillers mm-hmm. to a certain degree. Yeah, that's true. They were helping them out out of this whole thing. Well, as he continued his operation, Colonel Bailey befriended bootleggers, makers of steel parts, learned where to go to drink in the county and who the rum runners were and the routes into and out of the county. In the end, Bailey was convinced that every lawman, county official, and state attorney in the county had a hand in the operation in one way or another. (laughs) These men did not just take protection money. They coerced farmers to get into moonshining or face time in jail on a trumped-up charge. Operators paid $25 for each steal and $10 for each load hauled, with millions of gallons of moonshine flowing out of the county as a result. So, so, So let me get this right. You're saying that not only did they go and protect the still owners, they made farmers actually do distilling? That's what it sounds like to me. (sighs) Wow. That's corruption, Steve. It it is (laughs) quite a bit. Uh, Anyway, Bailey's report to his superiors alleged that the Franklin County Commonwealth's attorney won Charles Carter Lee, and keep that name in mind because it's a very important name, had met in 1928 with Sheriff Pete Hodges and the county deputies to propose that the county be divided up into districts for the purpose of assessing illegal distillers and bootleggers that $10 and $25 a month charge for the privilege of operating with the protection of county officers. The uh, governor of Virginia, Rod, was even in on the operation, although unwittingly. He had directed law enforcement to take fines from whiskey makers wherever it was possible to do so in order to keep the still operators out of Virginia jails and courts in order to relieve congestion. So that kind of gave them cover to take the protection money and just call it, quote unquote, fines. Well, it took over a year for Bailey to build his case. And what a case it was. He had specifically set his sights on Commonwealth's attorney Carter Lee. And here's where we get into that name. Do you know why Lee sounds so familiar, Rod? Steve, I would say it has something to do, ironically, with him being the grandnephew of General Robert E. Lee. Bingo. Well, 34 Franklin County residents were also indicted, although none quite so prominent as Mr. Lee, several sheriff's deputies, and a former member of the Virginia General Assembly. Seven defendants, including Sheriff D. Wilson Hodges, just went ahead and pled guilty. Seven others entered pleas of no contest. The prosecution called 176 witnesses, and the defense called 69, making this massive case the second longest case to try in Virginia history. It took about 10 weeks to get through that. Mm. Well, one of the more interesting witnesses in the case, you'll love this one, She was one of the most well-known rum runners in the business and a Franklin County native by the name of Willie Carter Sharp. Between 1927 and 1931, Ms. Sharp was known to have transported by car nearly 145,000 gallons of whiskey all by herself from distiller to customer. And during her testimony, she intrigued spectators with her diamond-studded teeth, uh, something not that common back in 1935. Well, on July 1st, 1935, after three days of deliberations, the jury returned its verdict. Twenty defendants were found guilty. Three, including Commonwealth's Attorney Lee and two sheriff's deputies, were, get this, acquitted. Even so, the sentences handed down amounted to an average of two years or less, with 13 getting probation only. So most of them were back in business before they had even been sent to serve their jail time and the trial had little real effect on the moonshining business in the county. Well, a side note to this story, Rod, the uh, court files and the transcript, guess what? They disappeared sometime in the 1950s. The last reference to the transcript is a 1945 notation that it was wired to the clerk of the U.S. District Court in Harrisonburg, Virginia. After that, it just disappeared. In 1991, a Rocky Mount attorney named T. Keister Greer, who later wrote his own book on the trial, now unfortunately out of print, went on a mission to locate the documents and even placed a classified ad in the Roanoke Times and World News offering a $1,000 reward for information leading to the trial transcript. Uh, The 1945 date is important, Rod, because in 1946, 
a federal grand jury indicted 24 more people on charges of tampering with the jury in the 1935 case. So this thing went on for 10 years. Wow. After a trial, 22 of those defendants were convicted, and coincidentally or not, Franklin County Sheriff Thomas Jefferson Richards, another one of those names I like, mm-hmm. who was one of those facing indictment, was gunned down along with a prisoner one week before the federal grand jury returned its conspiracy indictments. And Mr. Richards, if I'm not mistaken, was one of the people involved in all this stuff back in 1935. The jury tampering case file has also gone missing, along with the original court file that we can assume was sent to Harrisonburg for use in that trial. You know, Steve, this trial also inspired the movie. It's been a recent movie, too, Lawless, which Mm -hmm. featured Shia LaBeouf and Jessica Chastain and Tom Hardy. It's based on the novelist Matt Bondurant's book about his grandfather, who was a moonshiner in Franklin County at this time. And, you know, Steve, this is just one of several other moonshining stories that we're going to share with people in upcoming broadcasts on the podcast here of stories because we've got some to tell of. You know, one moonshiner who named his stills Salt Lake City and Kansas City. Mm. We have someone else that was known to fly moonshine into Cincinnati on an airplane. And no one ever knew that's what he did. Or at least the Federals and some of the other people didn't catch him. But most of the people around the area knew that he was flying moonshine into Cincinnati on a regular basis, supposedly to meet up with Al Capone's people there and be sent on into Chicago and points in between. Well, that sounds like one heck of an interesting story. I can't wait till you bring it to us. Okay. And that's the story of the Great Moonshine Conspiracy Trial, another of the stories that make up the history of this place called Appalachia. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to the podcast at iTunes or Google Play or on your favorite podcast app. We're on Facebook, too. Be sure to like us to get even more stories about Appalachia. And we're on Twitter as well, at Story Appalachia. Till next time, take care. So long, everybody.